We have a very special guest today. Our guest is Mr. Uh, George Azamka, a NASA astronaut, uh, who is going to tell us more about how it is to be in uh, space. Uh, so once again, thank you, George, for uh, joining us and for accepting the, the invitation. My pleasure, Maya. Um, let me see if I can get my display up and shared with you. Uh, is everyone seeing a PowerPoint? Not hearing from anyone. Yes, yes yeah, we yes, see yes, it. Yes. Fantastic, okay, well, let me get this going. Well, uh, welcome everyone from the New York Williamsburg High School for Architecture and Design. Um, very excited to be here with you today. Uh, I do wanna thank Maya and the Polish Cultural Institute for, for giving me this opportunity to be uh, talking to all of you. Um, I do want to talk a little bit about Nicholas Copernicus. Uh, the theme is Dare to be Copernicus. Well, who was he? Uh, he was a church administrator, a Polish canon of the Catholic Church, a uh, long, long time ago, as uh, Maya said. Um, and if you look at, at my bottom bubbles, uh, he, he was a very interested and educated person. Uh, his uh, father died when he was young. He was adopted by a um, Polish Catholic bishop and uh, pretty much how he got uh, the job that he had, which was really to, he wasn't a priest. His job was to uh, to kind of run things, to make sure the churches were in good shape, the uh, facilities were working, uh, there was security, the bills were paid, that kind of stuff. But um, as a result of that, he had a lot of specialties that were brought in front of him, um, and he had interest in all of those, uh, astronomy being, being one of them, and that's the one for which we're going to talk about uh, him today for, uh, but also law, uh, how the law worked, mathematics, and even astrology, which was uh, a way of uh, back then, and this is the early part of the, uh, the Renaissance, to find out how um, the stars affected uh, people's lives on Earth. Um, he developed what is called the heliocentric model of the universe. Uh, before then, uh, there was something called the Ptolemaic uh, model of the universe, uh, where in that model, that theory, the earth was the center of the universe. Everything went around the earth. Uh, there were observations, though, that made it uh, seem that that wasn't exactly accurate. Um, and his observations, and through a lifetime of study, uh, he decided that uh, he could prove that the sun was the center of the uh, universe. It's not, but it was better than the old theory. Uh, and that planets, including the Earth, rotate around the sun. And that also the uh, Earth rotates on its own axis. Uh, at the time, this was uh, very controversial. As a matter of fact, he didn't publish or the, his uh, model wasn't published till after he passed away. And it was up to others like Galileo to uh, take up the mantle uh, in terms of defending this and, and uh, letting it be known to people. So um, with all of his specialties, uh, Copernicus is what we would call today a polymath. And that is someone who knows about a lot of things because they're interested and curious in a lot of things. And when you're a polymath, um, because of the different areas that you're interested in, you look at problems in a different way. You, you have a different point of view in attacking those problems. It helps you be a more creative person. And really, when I think of architecture and design, which you folks do here, um, you are polymaths. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about human space flight, but when I talk about it, think about it uh, in terms of a polymath. Uh, you, you will hear me refer to things uh, about space and, and uh, how, does, um, how may that apply to something that you're working on or would like to do uh, here on Earth. A little bit about myself. Um, I'm, I was a kid in New York City uh, back in the uh, 60s and 70s. Um, and so my interest in space started back then. What was going on back then was the uh, the Apollo program. This is when astronauts would go to the moon. We're looking at going back again as part of the Artemis program. There are astronauts assigned to the first mission, as a matter of fact. But uh, when I was a kid, um, I, I had uh, heroes, uh, and the, my heroes at the time were uh, firemen. Uh, baseball players, uh, the New York Mets in particular, uh, won the World Series in 1969. This is about the time frame that uh, I became interested in space and also astronauts. And um, the thing I liked about astronauts is they uh, were to me a very calm, cool, collected lot. Uh, and um, 
uh, they could fix things and solve problems. And I wanted to be one of those kind of people. And I saw firemen and astronauts in, in much the same way. And that's, that's probably what got me going on my path. Um, eventually, I uh, uh, went to the Naval Academy. I joined the uh, Marine Corps, um, became a pilot, then a test pilot, and into NASA as an astronaut as a quick abbreviation. Uh, one note is that my father, uh, Conrad, was a, a interior designer. Uh, and he went to the Parsons School of Design, and he would have loved this school. So uh, he would be very happy that uh, that I'm talking to y'all. So um, that makes it extra nice for me. Um, my method today is I'm going to talk about the uh, last space shuttle mission that I went on. Uh, this was in 2010. Uh, it was to the International Space Station. It was an assembly mission. Uh, the six of us were a collection of... Uh, pilots uh, and scientists and engineers. You'll hear me refer to them from left to right. Uh, there, uh, Nick was a, a British uh, aerospace engineer. Uh, Terry next to him was an Air Force uh, pilot, test pilot. Bob was a, a scientist. Uh, Kay was a, a Navy uh, officer who flew on uh, naval aircraft as well. Uh, there was me and then Steve Robinson was uh, multiple degrees uh, in science and engineering. So a uh, very smart uh, crew that we had on board. Um, the flight was uh, a little bit over 14 days. Uh, it went from February 8th to the 21st, 2010. Uh, it was all at night. Uh, we took off at night. We landed at night. If you wanted to watch the, uh, uh, the mission, you'd have to kind of be up in the middle of the night to uh, watch it live. Um, our main job was to bring up a large module to the space station um, called the uh, Tranquility Module that had a bunch of recycling life equipment in there. Uh, we also brought up the cupola. The cupola is what you see on the patch um, above us. Let me see if I can. Yeah, my mouse works if you can see that. But uh, um, that's kind of what the cupola looked like. You'll see that uh, in the movie. Uh, and um, uh, the picture is the first picture. It's a rendition of the first picture of Earth taken from the moon. Uh, as I'm showing this movie, I'm gonna be talking about things that are going on. And, and as you're watching, you, you uh, see if you can ask or answer these questions for yourself. What is an orbit? Uh, what does it feel like to live in space? And uh, how do humans live in space? And I'll be talking kind of around the answers. I may you know, say one or two directly, but uh, uh, keep that in mind as, as you watch this movie. And with that, let me go ahead and get into it. Um, uh, this is from a NASA mission, not that long ago for me, but, uh, pretty, pretty long ago, I think from your, your time reference. Um, it was the middle of the night when we walked out, this is about midnight, uh, in February, walking out to the, uh, shuttle Endeavor on the launch pad, uh, fully fueled. It weighed about four and a half million pounds at about four in the morning. Uh, we launched. And uh, you hear some of the launch sounds uh, involved with lighting the three main engines, giving them a quick test, and then releasing from the pad. You'll see pictures from inside the cockpit, uh, from outside the front window that just popped up, and then um, launching uh, as seen from the outside. The uh, shuttle passes the tower already going 120 miles an hour. Uh, we're burning 10,000, I'm sorry, 10 tons of propellant each second and uh, accelerating quickly. You'll notice in this picture, it's a curved flight. We're not going straight up. We start curving and uh, laying on our side, essentially on our back uh, and accelerating quickly uh, as we get into space. Uh, at about 150,000 feet and Mach 5, the solid rocket boosters already each weighed uh, one and a half million pounds. They're already expended of all their um, uh, all the propellant and they are separated from the shuttle. And this is a scene of the last few seconds of us under 3G about to go to 0G. There, Right there is when it happened. And uh, right now we are in orbit in space. The flashes around the space shuttle, you can see some of it happening in the window inside. That's from plasma. And essentially we are smashing into uh, molecules, driving electrons into a higher orbit. And then they, when they uh, return to their normal energy state, they release light. So that's uh, plasma. We separated from the uh, tank there and uh, continued on up into orbit. To join with the International Space Station, it's kind of like 
Um, one of those funnels you might see in a magazine, I'm sorry, in a museum or a planetarium in reverse where the marble starts at the top and it's going slowly and then it kind of picks up speed as it goes in the middle. We do that in reverse. So we uh, catch up to the space station by doing an orbit underneath it. And then as we get closer, we raise our orbit more gradually uh, to join with it. This is a backflip to let the uh, station crew members take a picture of our tiles to make sure that uh, they were okay. Um, and we would need those for re-entry. So that was very important. From inside the shuttle, this is what it looked like coming out of that. But uh, obviously with our belly up to the space station, we were kind of blind as to how we were actually doing things. Uh, and so it was a good view to see that, uh, hey, we came out okay. On board the space station were five other astronauts that we joined. Uh, in some cases, we haven't seen these folks for, uh, for months or years. Uh, if you look around, you'll see there are blue uh, handrails. And so you'll notice that uh, folks will kind of either grab onto the handrails or tuck their feet underneath them. And that's to keep them from, I'll, I'll call it floating around. They're, they have to stay fixed and that's, uh, that's the method by which they do it. Uh, our mission, like I told you uh, at the beginning, was to move this large, I call it school bus sized uh, module out of the payload bay of Space Shuttle Endeavor and attach it to the space station. It weighed with the cupola probably around 40,000 pounds, uh, but it, it had 40,000 pounds of mass, but it really didn't weigh anything. So think about that. And here's a, another example of that concept inside the space station, we were moving this 800 pound rack somewhat effortlessly. It still had mass, uh, so we had to be very ginger about how we moved it, but we could move it ourselves with fingertip control. Uh, I'm gonna stop it right here. I want you to see something, I'm gonna point to it. Um, these are our spacewalkers going on the outside. This is the best view of this. There's not a better view later on in the video, but this is a, a safety tether that comes from the astronaut to the International Space Station. This is Bob. In this case, I can tell Bob because of the red stripes. But uh, should a spacewalker separate from the space station, they're gone. They cannot kip back. You can't swim back. Uh, and so it's very, it's kind of like mountain climbing where you want to make sure you've got some kind of tether attached to the space station. Um, and uh, not only that, but uh, they also use other tethers. I'll show you another one here in a minute to uh, help them work. Uh, there is a, an emergency backpack where they could fly back should that happen, but uh, that's, that's really worst case. Um, you can see in space that uh, uh, things just kind of tend to do what they want to do. They, the, there's kind of a, a stiffness to them and they don't want to lay down. You know, there's not gravity to help things lay flat. Um, the difference between day and night is 400 degrees. It's minus 200 degrees uh, out in space in shadow or at night, and it's plus 200 in sun. Um, and here you can see some of these hoses are just, they, they just kind of stick out. Uh, they're not flat. And here's, here's where that really came into effect. Uh, here, Bob and Nick were trying to fold up this cover from the cupola and put it into a bag, and gravity is not helping it. It's, it's uh, a bit of work. I'll stop this one here too. I want to show this to you. Um, this bottom um, arm sticking out from Nick is a uh, body restraint tool, but this is a way for him to attach his body and hold it in one place to the International Space Station while he undoes uh, these orbital locks. Otherwise, when he used this, I'll call it a drill, it was a pistol grip tool to try to remove these launch locks by rotating them like you would a drill the locks wouldn't move. He would rotate around the locks uh, if he didn't have that BRT or a tether to, uh, to help him doing that task. Okay, me goofing off in space. So it looks like I'm floating, right? Or flying, but what am I feeling, right? What's that feel like? Look at these people with superhuman strength, Nick and, um, uh, and Kay and Stevie Ray. Uh, there you can see uh, the effect of surface tension in up in space. Uh, we have water balls and uh, um, that is, you know, the water isn't falling, obviously, or scattering, but uh, the surface tension is holding it together. What does that mean for operation of fluids and, and stuff in space? If you look around uh, design wise, look, look, we've got all this uh, Velcro all around and we've got drink bags and uh, we've got uh, cutting kits and first aid kits and procedures all kind of stapled to this uh, 
I'm sorry, lying up against this Velcro. Uh, and then this color, this kind of, I'll call it a tangerine pink salmon color is very unique there while we we're having dinner. Uh, dinner was a nice thing for us to be able to do. It was a normal thing uh, for us to enjoy and get together and spend time together. Um, and here's an experiment that uh, Bob is doing. We'll see if you guys can figure out for yourself what he is up to um, in space. You can see all of our bags that we have around where we keep our stuff. And, uh, well, he is making himself a yummy peanut butter and jelly tortilla, uh, which is its own reward. Uh, sleeping in space, more of the same right? to keep us from floating around and bumping into stuff and each other. We really are restrained in those sleeping bags. And then we use earplugs and, the, and also eye covering to, uh, uh, protect against the day night cycles and exercise exercise is important, um, for us because we're not otherwise using our muscles. Okay. We opened up the cupola and this was kind of the big deal for us. We had this big, beautiful window now that could not only look down on earth, but look back at the space station. We could see uh, the other visiting space vehicles. Those were a Russian crew aircraft and a Russian cargo resupply aircraft. Um, and uh, we just had a, a tremendous view and uh, could see all kinds of things uh, on Earth uh, in a way we, we couldn't see them before. You can see how thin the atmosphere is and kind of vaporous. You know, down on Earth, it looks like a big blue sky. Well, you'll see it's not that big. It's just not that thick when you look at it from the space station. We also got, uh, because of our orbit, we had 16 sunrises and 16 sunsets every day. So uh, we got to see those changes pretty dramatically and, and quite frequently, which was amazing. Well, we were done with our mission up on the space station. It was time to separate. Um, Terry and I swapped roles. Terry did the flying uh, out the back window and I ran the computers and the procedures. And we backed out to uh, 400 feet and then started to fly around. The sun was coming up behind us. And as, as that happens, you can see the shadow of the Space Shuttle Endeavor on the solar array of the space station. And we started this fly around. The fly around is uh, one and a half laps around the space station. It helps us document uh, any change that might have happened in the space station, either from a uh, micro meteorite uh, collision or something that uh, might have uh, been damaged uh, unexpectedly from uh, exposure to space or radiation or the sun. Um, but really, it also provided some of the best views because you have the contrast of the space station against, uh, which is very metallic, very uh, artificial, man-made against the, the beautiful hues of, of the earth um, as we went around. And then it was time to come back. Uh, our spacesuits, the, the blue underwear has water tubes that help keep our bodies cool uh, underneath the orange um, launch and reentry suits. And then that tangerine glow, that's that plasma again that is uh, uh, caused because of our great velocity hitting into atmospheric molecules. Um, outside, it's about 5,000 degrees, five feet in front of the, uh, the space shuttle. And it's about 2,500 is about half that uh, actually on the skin. The final approach is uh, at 20 degrees. That's about seven times steeper than an airliner. And we had to do that because we didn't have um, engines uh, to go around. So it was all a glider. Uh, we're trying to touch down around 195 knots. And uh, we also had a drag chute to, that had to come out to help us slow down to take uh, some of the, the speed off so we didn't have to count on our brakes. And uh, at the end of a mission, uh, we were looking forward to getting back with families, having a shower, and getting some, uh, some fresh food. Okay, so let's see. Let me see if I can get to the next one here. All right, so here are the three questions. Um, and I'll just kind of go over the answers pretty quickly here. I'll give you a little diagram uh, in just a second. But... Uh, an orbit is a, um, it's a circular path around a larger object by a smaller object, uh, in our case, influenced by gravity. Um, what does it feel like to be in space? Well, let me go to this next, uh, next slide to, uh, to talk about it. So uh, here's, here's the Earth, and we can call the box the space shuttle or the space station. Uh, a suborbital flight is a flight that comes up and then comes down 
straight, you know, if you go straight up, you're coming straight down. But if, as in the case of the space shuttle, you go up and you just gain velocity, uh, eventually, I'm going to transit to this big box here, you're going fast enough so that even though there is gravity, which is pulling you back down to Earth, the Earth's surface is curving away from under you. So a, a nice phrase to explain all that is you are falling around the Earth. So that's what an orbit is. That's what it feels like um, when you are an astronaut in space. It looks like floating, like, yeah, very happy. It feels like falling the whole time you're up there. And uh, living in space is essentially dealing with that feeling. Uh, okay, quick uh, review of technologies that come from space. Space is in our lives. Um, you guys use it. Uh, years ago when they're trying to build the moon rockets, they had to find a way how to predict uh, how um, structural things like tanks uh, stages would behave to a heat stress and stress of launch. And so they came up with a program called NASTRAN, uh, which uses this finite element analysis, breaking things up into little pieces and uh, extending that behavior across all those pieces. We use this now for everything, airplanes, cars, ships, we use it even for uh, CGI. When we watch movies, uh, you know, see the octopus man going around or the superhero um, uh, flying through, uh, uh, through the scene. Uh, also GPS, um, oops, let me go back to that. GPS uh, is used for navigation. That's a space application of an idea that we've had around for about a hundred years or so, which is essential to use radio waves, the intersection of those radio waves to tell where we are. But we also get extremely accurate time and use it for uh, everything pretty much, uh, not only getting around, but for um, business applications and, uh, and all kinds of things. And then light therapy up in space uh, because of those day night cycles, um, we uh, 16 sunrises and sunsets. Well, we don't have 16 days per day. We have one day. And so uh, we influence that with, uh, with light. Um, blue light, it tends to be daylight, tends to keep you awake. Reddish uh, light tends to signal to you that it's time to sleep. It also gets you a melatonin release, which is, is good for, uh, for health uh, up there. Uh, I want to do a quick commercial for uh, the International Space Station. So you in New York have two sighting opportunities. Uh, when the space station fly, has, flies over, this is a, a long exposure uh, photograph. It doesn't look like this, but what it'll look like is a very bright star moving across the sky pretty quick. Uh, so that, that's what you'll see. Um, the first one is tonight. Starting at 624 for four minutes, look towards the western sky. And if you can see stars, uh, you should be able to see this one. This one is going to reach to the, a height. It'll start out in the west-southwest and go to a height of uh, 56 degrees, uh, again, in the western sky, but uh, north-northwest. So keep an eye out for that. And if you can't make that one tomorrow, there's even a better one. Starts at 536 p.m. earlier in the day. Um, but it's 10 degrees above southwest to 19 degrees above northeast. But it goes almost right over the top of New York, 83 degrees. So great opportunity to, uh, to see the space station. Spot the station, by the way, is the website to find all this. Stuff. Okay, uh, last, uh, just to close out this uh, uh, presentation, um, I love this picture. This is Tracy Caldwell. She was a classmate of mine. She, she's married now. Tracy Dyson's her name. Um, and uh, so people wonder what the, what the universe is like from space. Well, here in this picture, you can see the universe above. Uh, pretty vast, pretty dark, though. The universe below, which is the Earth, full of life and uh, weather and uh, all kinds of living things. And then you have the universe within. Um, by the time you are 15 years old, you're, our brain's thinking about 100 times per second. So by the time... Uh, you reach 15, you've got almost 5 billion impressions, uh, sights, thoughts, sounds that you've heard. And that's, that's a universe uh, that, that you can use to, uh, to help create and make associations uh, in your careers. Okay, with that, um, I think I am done presenting. And uh, Maya, over to you. I think we might have some questions. Yes, we're right here. I'll yeah. ask uh, Giovanni to ask the question because of my voice. 
All okay. right. So, uh, George, I just wanted to let you know that uh, PS175 from Rego Park uh, joined us uh, in Queens. So they uh, they logged on and uh, we have some students uh, fr from that school uh, with us. But um, so we have a couple of questions. You answered some already in your presentation. So uh, the first question, uh, what role does design play in space travel? Can you explain how materials and the products that you use in space travel, why these materials are so important? Right. And, and uh, yeah, great question. Uh, you, you guys saw a lot of that. I'm, I'm going to look at the camera instead of all, all you beautiful faces out there. Um, the uh, it, it's, it's done in a very practical manner. Um, the things that NASA is worried about are uh, fire uh, and what they call off gassing. Um, these are things that uh, we don't have to think about it as much uh, or in the same way on Earth because you can get out of the house or the building uh, or you can open a window. But uh, the space station and or any spacecraft is a closed environment. And uh, even something as simple as a, as a Sharpie, uh, which is an alcohol based pen, can contaminate uh, experiments or uh, uh, or equipment up there. So um, that's the materials part of it. I talked about the light part of it, uh, how we have we use, use light to uh, help with uh, resting. But there's a lot of work that could be done in aesthetics, right? What you guys saw were, was just a very kind of a clean, white, utilitarian, almost like an office, but it wasn't very homey, except for that one place where that salmon, that pink color was. Uh, and that's the front of the, the Russian segment. The Russian part is older, but it's more homey. It's more comfortable in there. They uh, have uh, carpeting and other things that uh, help humans, I think, feel more comfortable in space. The one place that is really nice for the astronauts is the, um, the crew quarters. It's just kind of like a closet, but uh, it's a nice place where the astronauts can go and, and be by themselves and, and uh, uh, feel a little bit more at home. So, so that's done. A lot of work to be done, though, and so you guys might be part of that someday. So the second question, um, what made you want to become an astronaut? Uh, how did the exploration bring you to that, you know, um, the concept of exploration? Yeah, I, I uh, you know, I've, I've got to say, I'll, I'll go back to um, my early time in, in New York City, and it's a, uh, uh, it's a canyon. Uh, you, you see, you have the, all these wonderful uh, buildings around, and I was curious about who made those, how they know how to put them together so they would work, and um and then by extension, we, we did have the Apollo program, uh, which was prominent. Uh, and uh, um, I had space toys and everything. And, and I wanted to be part of the group that had something to do with space. And so that's that's what got me going initially. Now, you know, in life, things change, things come back and forth. But the uh, the space, fortunately for me, was an opportunity that uh, that was always out there. And, and I was able to, to go after it. It was a dream. And uh, I was I was very fortunate to, to be able to be part of that. And uh, the last question, one of the students um, asked, what does it smell like up in space? Um, you know, they, they've said that they've heard that it smells like burnt steak. Right. Good, good question. Uh, there is a smell um, and I smell it when uh, I was one of my jobs was bringing the spacewalkers back in from outer space and, and they uh, had a certain smell on their spacesuits. Um, I think the burnt steak, it's not wrong. It's just that there's this unique smell and whoever said burnt steak was taking a guess as, hey, what's it smell like? Um, to me, it smelled more like burnt plastic. And I think that smell comes from uh, the sun. Remember we talked about how hot it gets up there kind of cooking uh, the the white part, the, the covering that was on those spacesuits, which are Nomex. And they, I think they have like a petroleum-based uh, kind of a plastic substance to them. So that stuff would be up to 200 degrees uh, for a period of time. And I think there was off-gassing uh, from those spacesuits as I, as I brought them back in. All right, George, thank you uh, so much for um, spending some time with us. We're going to make the recording available for everyone. So, um, you know, everyone can watch it from the beginning. Um, and Maya, if you want to just 
Yes, I just want to say thank you very much. It was so interesting, you know, to to see the film and um, to listen to you, how it really is to be in space and what are the, you know, what, what does the astronaut experience? Uh, and thank you for linking it with uh, Copernicus because, you know, it all comes together. Absolutely. Well, I'll just stay interested, stay curious in how things work and um, the whole world's out in front of you. It's going to be great. It was wonderful visiting with everyone. I really enjoyed talking to you and, and, uh, and seeing you today. Thank you. Thank All you right, everyone. Much. Have a wonderful day and have a good weekend. Thank you. Have a great weekend. Bye-bye.